Paul Nyland is a writer, commentator, a resident of Kiev. He also runs Lifeline Ukraine, a charitable support crisis line for army veterans. Uh, and we've spoken many times. Hi, Paul. How are you doing? You must be happily uh, shocked, as many of us, to understand how successful this counterattack and strategy by the Ukrainian army has been in the Kharkiv region. I, I, I was shocked by the speed of it. I was shocked by how fast they were able to move into the occupied areas in, in Kharkiv. But um, I'm, I'm not only pleased about the developments there, the progress that the Ukrainian army have been making, but I'm also quite pleased about what's been happening in the south as well. We have to remember there's two different fronts presently, and uh, what's happening in Kherson is, uh, is equally important, and um, th there's been gains that have been made there in previous days as well. So yeah, we, all across the battlefield, there's, there's good news for the Ukrainian armed forces. So do you think that this denies, deprives Putin's army of victory in, in Luhansk and Donetsk? Absolutely, yeah. Um, the, the, some of the towns that have been retaken have been um, important railway hubs, and we know that that's uh, one of the main means of Russian logistics. Uh, they, they use railways for transporting most of their ammunition. So having having taken them back in the Kharkiv region, yeah, it certainly puts a dent in what Putin was hoping to do in capturing the rest of uh, Donetsk and Lugansk that he hadn't uh, previously taken in 2014. It, it, it really strikes a blow to that. But more, it strikes a blow to, I mean, we know that the morale amongst the Russian armed forces is already rock bottom anyway, but it strikes a blow to their psychology. Because, you know, as, as, as frontline troops are retreating, fleeing, you know, in, in haste, they're coming I mean, up against... Ru the running for their lives and leaving dozens and dozens of, of tanks and armored personnel carriers and artillery pieces changing out of, out of uniform. I mean, this was a serious route. A, a very, very serious route. Yeah, exactly. And, and what I was going to say is that when they're meeting, when they're retreating, and they're meeting their, their colleagues who are supposed to be, you know, in, in the rear and shoring up the rear side, um, the, the, the panic is just going to be spread and manifest throughout the entire Russian army. And as well, again, if I link it back to what's happening in the south, you know, the Russians that are sitting there in Kherson, whether they're in Kherson city on the right bank or whether they're in Kherson Oblast closer to Crimea, they, they're also seeing that their, their comrades are being routed, completely routed, and they know that that's coming for them next as well. How do you read so the, the change in rhetoric in Russia, like for instance, I'm reading today, uh, Bogdan Bespelko, the member of the Council for Interethnic Relations under the President of the Russian Federation, speaks out on television saying, for two months, Ukrainian armed forces and military equipment have been massing in the area. All telegram channels have been writing about it. Where was our damn reconnaissance? All mm -hmm. of their heads should be laying on Putin's desk, hacked off at the base. Of course, this is a mm -hmm. tactical defeat, and I hope it'll be very sobering. I mean, we have not heard anything like that uh, from, from Russian propaganda channels since this started back in February. Yeah, but it, it's it's very interesting how that's phrased, though, Dana, the way that you just read it out. So their heads should be taken off and put in front of Putin. What they're, what they're deliberately trying to do is to avoid blaming Putin himself. But at the end, well, not at the end of the day, at Agreed. the beginning of the day, at the beginning of this phase of the war, that was it was entirely Putin's decision. And, and the, the, the catastrophe that has followed since is Putin's responsibility. So, you know, it's, it's interesting that they're trying to spin this away from blaming the, the, the top man himself. But yeah, well, I, I mean, I, and there's there's a little bit of, uh, you know, the, the, there's a little bit of practice nuance in there for them, too. Right. Because if you speak against Putin. Uh, in today's Russia, that's a pretty good guarantee that you're going to be picked up by the, the FSB or the security services at night and thrown into prison. So you, you criticize as much as you can, but you never quite attack President Putin himself. But it seems slowly to be turning that way. Well, either thrown in prison or thrown out of a window of, you know, of an eighth floor building or, or whatever it is. We, we see been a few of them. Common. It, it, it happens all the time. But I mean, what they did at the beginning of the war in Russia was they they criminalized uh, any 
uh, criticism of the armed forces themselves, right? So, you know, they, they, they tried to paint this broad brush and it, it's not just the criticism of Putin, but uh, any criticism of the war effort it supposedly lands people in jail. I, I read a statistic last week that something like 3,800 administrative uh, cases have been opened against people who've complained against the war. Well, you know, 3,800 out of a population of 144 million, there's really not enough internal objection uh, from the Russian population yet. And I think one of the reasons for that is because they simply don't, they don't know what the casualty count is. And there was a document that was released last week, which was from uh, Russia's own finance ministry, which was... This is on payments to families. Exactly right. Payments to families. And, and that, I think the number was 48,383 payments have been made already. And there's still many more being processed. And that was before or, or on the, 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 the eve of the Kharkiv counteroffensive as well, which has obviously resulted in a lot more, a, a lot more Russian deaths. Um, uh, and, I, and by, by always... the way, we don't know what the Ukrainian death toll is either. And the fact is, I mean, a lot of military analysts say that when you start advancing and counterattacking, mm -hmm. you know, you can suffer four to five times the number of casualties. So no doubt Ukraine paid uh, a price. We don't know how high for that counteroffensive. Uh, uh, that's actually one of the things that I... I, I, I refuse to touch on when I'm when I'm sharing news on social media, you know, reports of deaths of specific Ukrainian soldiers, um, but it's simply because many of them are my friends and I, 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 I just can't even contemplate it at the moment. We, you know, in the final reckoning after the after the victory, that's that, that that's when I'm going to be taking stock of that. But I, I, I can't let that blow me at the moment. I, I, I need to focus on the things that, uh, that, that that we can talk about that are that are positive and and those things include the the delivery of heavy heavy weapons that um have enabled ukraine's counteroffensive the the retaking of territory the isolation of you know the the pocket of troops that is in Kherson city that that's the kind of things that i want to talk about but yeah for certain for certain the, the losses on ukraine side are also going to be um very, very heavy. And I, it, it was interesting yeah. to see, and, and ballsy as well. I, President Zelensky went to Izium today, you know, and, uh, you know, to go and see the, the troops on the front line of a town that was just liberated days ago, right? And and one of the things that they did there that was very poignant was they, they stood um, a minute silence for those who have fallen. But I, I'll look at that. I'll look at that after after this is all said and done. Is there a sense of foreboding at times because you see, you know, with uh, the advances on the battlefield by Ukraine, the Russians begin to get cornered in certain areas. And there is talk even that, you know, in the south, that soon the Crimea may come under the long range artillery of the, U the Ukrainian army. I mean, mm -hmm. you're talking about airfields, you're talking about the home of the Black Sea fleet. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, the Russians can get very desperate very quickly. And then you have people like Dmitry Medvedev, who was the former president and prime minister. And, you know, he's president Putin's poodle on the Security Council. His rhetoric is always kind of off the charts. And some people say that it, it it's, you know, alcohol induced at times. But I mean, he's talking about that th this will bring World War Three. <laughs> yeah, I saw that as well. Um I mean, that's that's literally the best reaction to Medvedev, isn't it? Just just to laugh at him, right? I mean, what what World War Three? What what the 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 thing that people have to remember? Uh, and I was discussing actually an, an article on this escalation rhetoric uh, earlier on today. Um, what what can Russia actually escalate with? You know, it, 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 how would they uh, fight nuclear the weapons? War? Is the fear? Well. Yeah, but I mean, the, the thing about the way that the Russian uh, military command is structured with regard to uh, issuing that uh, order is that is that it, it's not just the choice of one man. It's not just you know the the insane lunatic that is Vladimir Putin. He doesn't have sole authority to to do this himself. He needs the buy-in of his generals, and and they know. Although it's always missing from 
you know, the propaganda evening TV talk shows when they're talking about annihilating the United Kingdom, which you know is where you're sitting. And, you know, they're, they're, they're always talking about these kind of things. Thank you for reminding these... me about that. Yeah. When they're talking about a nuclear tsunami uh, of, of water covering the island. Yeah, I've, I've heard that one. Yeah, that's what they said. And that was like, I don't know, two months ago, they said they, they threatened to do something like that. But but what they always don't factor in or don't talk about is that there, there would be an immediate counter response. I mean, by, by going nuclear, Putin is going to ensure the destruction of Moscow and St. Petersburg and many, you know, many, many Russian citizens at the same time. It's it's quite I've, I've I, I mean I grew up in the area era when we were talking about mad you know mutually assured destruction and you know that's that's what I always think about and 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 you know try to yeah. uh, but take I mean some it may not be from, that Paul you know where where there's a massive nuclear counterstrike right I mean it may be that the the West and NATO and America then starts doing conventional strikes inside Russia but certainly I mean you know the Rose Gottemuller, who I know very well, who was one of the chief arms negotiators under the START treaties, she, even she has come out expressing fear that Russia could go nuclear and that they continually, uh, she's urging Western leaders continually to warn Moscow of what the potential costs of that would be if they dare to use something like that. I mean, but that's what I'm saying. Like they, they already know in actual fact what the costs would be. But it's right to be reminding them that they should just never go there. But it, but again, you know, like if 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 you look at the the the, the try to follow a chain of logic to get to that point, with with Russia's uh, land forces being routed again, hammered in the the conventional conflict on the ground. One sec. Uh, how do, how does that then lead to them, you know, having justification for the use of nuclear uh, nuclear weapons? It, it it just doesn't. It it doesn't. It, I, I, I yes, it's right to, right. as you say, keep reminding them of the consequences of this. But yeah. I just don't see it happening. Well, I mean, let's pray you're completely right, and uh, and and that we we don't even have to contemplate something as, I mean, it's crazy as that. But w tell me, where do you think that this goes from here? Is there a sense there? that the Ukrainian army, which may be slowing down a little bit. I mean, you can't push on days and days and days without mm -hmm. resting, refeeding your troops, refueling. No. Um, is there a sense that this is going to stall now for the winter? Or do you think that we'll see even bigger cities fall uh, in, in the south as the Ukrainian army has momentum now and that maybe they may go after, you know, areas in the in the Donbass um, and in even Crimea itself. Yeah, I, I was reading a very good thread yesterday from Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling, and he was talking about exactly that. Like, if, if your troops are pushing forward, the maximum that you can allow them to do that for yeah, is I read the like same five one. days. You, you saw the same one, right? Yeah. I mean, the, so, you know, that's they've reached that point. They, they must be exhausted. And, and so it's right that they are resting them for a period of time before they recommence. When, when they re-engage, because of where they are geographically, it is going to be uh, coming down towards the Donbass from the north. And also Ukrainian forces are, are, are prodding into uh, the, the Donetsk and Lugansk areas as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, and, I, and it's important... And I know you know this, but I think maybe a lot of other people do that. That that's not some uh, vertical or lateral um, front line. That once you take the, the Kherson Oblast, then you start coming around. You know, it's been described as kind of a a, a left wheeling uh, wagon wheel, where you start mm -hmm. coming around behind and trapping a lot of Russian forces who, by the way, have been cut off by this long-range artillery, taking out bridges, cut off from re refueling and, and food uh, and support. So, I mean, indeed, it, it changes just not the Kherson um, area, but, I mean, the entire battlefield. Yeah, so, I mean, if you, if you go back to uh, Kherson, and that actually links back to uh, the, the last question that you're asking as well about, about Crimea. Crimea has already seen several attacks there, um, uh, the Saki Air Force Base being the, the, the biggest one, obviously. Um, <clears throat> but but yeah, once once Kherson has been liberated, then yes, very much Crimea is in play and it is within range of the high Mars and crabs and Caesars, the, the, the heavy weapons that we've uh, received from 
the US and, and uh, Poland and France respectively. And, and very much the return of, of, of Crimea it is a part of the stated uh, war aims of Ukraine right now and, and has been almost since the, the, the 24th of February when this escalation came. It was okay. Everything, you know, Minsk is obviously dead, and and or, you know, all bets are off, and everything is on the table. And and returning all of Ukraine's territories, including the areas of Donbas that Russia occupied in 2014, and including the Crimean Peninsula, that that is that is where this war ends. That that is what is the the, the ultimate objective, and it is and he's absolutely right as well. There was an interesting thing actually. Let me just tag this on. Um, Sergei Aksyonov, the uh, Kremlin-appointed head of, of Crimea, uh, has uh, said in recent days that there's going to be serious fines and punishments for people who are chanting Ukrainian patriotic slogans <laughs> or singing Ukrainian songs in Crimea itself. And so, you know, I saw that and I, I just went, I'm so grateful that he's confirming that there remains a great deal of, of uh, you know, patriotism for Ukraine on the peninsula and, the, and that he's worried about it. You know, and the other thing that shows that, that uh, the Russians are very worried about the, the uh, position of Crimea as well is that lots of military families uh, are, are being moved out of the peninsula and back to Russia proper, Russia itself. Um, so they, they know what's coming. Last question to you. Do you think that this silences a lot of the um, criticism in the West from people are saying that the economic price of this conflict is too high. Let's try to impose some kind of peace negotiation or settlement, that it's just a frozen conflict. It could go on for years. That that this counteroffensive by the Ukrainians has, has shown that actually victory could be in sight. Uh, victory is, is in sight. I, I, I don't know how long it's going to take us to get to the finish line, but certainly victory is in sight because because the Russians are collapsing everywhere and they will continue to collapse. The, the other the other thing that Ukraine is able to do as well, I mean, we were talking about the rest in, in the Kharkov uh, uh, region be, because they had to, but but Ukraine is able to pick which which targets it wants to go after next and and so it you know immediately with the success of of Kharkiv there were hits again on the bridge that isolates now the Russian troops in Kherson itself yesterday uh, yesterday I believe it was there were uh, hits on the Russian base at an airfield just outside of Melitopol which is in Zaporizhia Oblast as well they can't sleep anywhere so so yes the 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 victory is in sight whether whether that um, you know shuts up uh, certain parties who are complaining about the economic cost of supporting Ukraine or, or whatever, I think Ursula von der Leyen said it today with with the first lady, Ukraine's first lady, in in the European Parliament with her that yes, the, there is a price to be paid in dollars, but the price that Ukraine pays is in lives. And I mean, you you know what I do? I I, I don't put a dollar value on a single human life. I I I I. I I, I think that that is something that is every life is is priceless, and um, <clears throat> that's that that's the cost that we're paying here. Uh, it, it's not a, it's not about money. It's it's about it's about liberating, because you asked as well about you know freezing the conflict and having a, a negotiated settlement. It, it's about liberating the people who are on these occupied territories, and this is something that we've been seeing over the last week, especially is is how they're greeting. The Ukrainian troops, as they roll through their villages and come into their towns and cities, they're crying and they're hugging them and saying, we've been waiting for you. Yeah. Everywhere that the Russians occupy, we, 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 we are going to uncover more and more evidence of torture and war crimes in all of these places. The, those lives have been made hell and they have so. to be freed. Paul Nyland, great to talk to you, Paul. Thank you so much. As always. Thank you, Dana.